And he was like, well, actually I do. I have a, I have a contact, he had a contact on his Art Snacks network, a teacher named Govinda Prasad Panthi, who was working at a school in Bakishwari, Nepal. Now, we found out after talking with Govinda that the situation was so dire that some of his students had to wash and rewash their paper in order to complete their assignments. After one Skype call with the classroom, uh, me and the senior leaders at Bueller High School decided that we wanted to pursue this project and that we felt we could truly leave a legacy with this project. Uh, here, this picture illustrates we only had three pictures of the school when we started the senior project. These pictures, uh, one picture was of Govinda, one of the students, and one of the school buildings. Here, the buildings illustrated another, uh, another issue with the school. Some of these buildings don't have windows. They don't have protection from the elements. If it's pouring rain at the school, that means children do not get to go to school or learn for a single day. Because of this, we knew we were galvanized to action to try to make a difference for this school. And we're shut down. After two months and three Skype call conversations with Govinda, my senior class officer came up to me and said, Ben, I'm incredibly worried, but I think this is a scam. There are signs all over the place that this, that, uh, this could be a scam and we need to put the project on hold until we can confirm its existence. He told us that uh, he, until we could find the school on a map, we probably <coughs> couldn't go forward with this project. So I'm from the outside here. Recall that I'm not involved in the project. Recall that I haven't even been directly involved with any of the Skype calls or conversations that they've had to, with Govinda at this point in the project. And from the outsider's perspective, it was clear that this project might not have a future. It was clear that the thing that we had invested in for our senior legacy might not be able to happen. And it was all because of a very legitimate worry that he might be scamming us. I didn't think it was legitimate. Let me be honest with you. For my senior class officer to come up to me and tell me the man I had been talking to for two months, Govinda, was a scam artist, I was pretty offended. I mean, what's the worst that could happen by sending thousands of dollars to a source <laughs> miles away? I mean, really. And so I think we all know this situation and it's our worst nightmare. We all know who the Nigerian prince is. He may have taken up about a third of your emails in the last 10 years or so, but apparently he's just inherited a large sum of money from the Bank of Nigeria, and you're also a part of that inheritance. All you have to do is give him your bank information. So this is where our senior officer is coming from. This is where he is finding his action to say, this might be a scam and you guys really need to consider this. So we want to stop for a moment. How many of you believe that this is a legitimate concern before starting a big project like this? Absolutely. So we want to send you on a web quest. We want to put you in our shoes. Imagine that you don't know where this school is and you can't find out by using wiki articles because Govinda wrote them and they might not be legitimate and you can't use our website because that didn't exist at the time. We'd like you to go on the internet, find an online map and see if you can locate the SAV school. Go. Uh, SAV school. It, um, and it's an abbreviation. It's a very long name. There's a perk in this for everyone. First person that can find it on a map gets an open world water bottle. So, let's see. What's the name of school? SAV school. SAV school. SAV school. And if we're struggling a little bit, we'll give you a couple minutes and then we'll provide a hint. You don't want to find it on a map. The dot org. We, we are looking for a map because that's what we were challenged to do. Our senior officer wanted to see physical evidence that this school existed. And not done by Govinda. Not done by Govinda, right. He wrote some Wikipedia articles trying to get his country. Uh, Nepal? Thank you. Did this one work? I got it. All right, okay. Let's verify this. Let's make sure this is legitimate. Because I'm worried this is the Nigerian you, prince. You guys know this is Govinda because he's a friend of mine on Facebook and I oh. and he had a map. Well, I think we would I think we would prefer something a little less connected with Govinda, but No, it's okay, it's okay. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Can't, it, it, it's in a town called Bagashwari, Nepal. Google Earth might be an excellent tool to use in this case. <laughs> Bagashwari, B 
E A G E S H I W O R I. Can you spell bag of story again? Uh huh. B A G E S H W O R I. Looks like Michael Campbell might have something for us today. Yep, there we go. The Sav, the Sav School in Bagashori, Nepal. Michael Campbell. Can I take this for a moment? What he's found is the SAV school, oops, I don't need that. The SAV school higher secondary school, and this is the first, very similar to the first image that we found using Google Maps when we wanted to legitimize the cause. Congratulations. <laughs> If anything, this web quest illustrated in three minutes the task that we were set to, that we were put on over the next few weeks. What we ended up finding is we found on Google Earth a picture of the roof of the school that matched the roof that we had in the photographs that we the, uh, one of the three photographs we had of the school. This was enough for our senior officer to say, "We're not going to move on. We're not going to find another project. We're going to stick to this project." But he still wanted more verification before moving forward. And so there was a teacher who saved us. There was a teacher who had actually visited the school, and he had done some volunteering projects with them. His name was David Kenny. David Kenny, uh, Govinda gave us David Kenny's contact information and asked David if he could provide with us with any support or any evidence that he had been in the school and that the school existed. David responded by sending a testimonial that of the of the SAP school and ten pictures of himself at the school. What was truly telling about the testimonial was that David said out of all of the schools he visited, he uh, is a teacher from Australia, out of all of the schools he visited in the, last, in the years that he's been doing this, this was the most underprivileged school, but this school by far had the most hope out of any school he had been to. He said the students here wanted to be doctors, wanted to be lawyers, wanted to be teachers, dreams that we can all identify with. And he said that he was so happy that someone was finally getting involved to try to help this school. This David Kinney's involvement galvanized the project forward, and, be, and we were able then to move towards getting a library to these students. Now remember that the library exists as our first goal. We thought, what can we do for these students to give them something that they don't have that we regularly take for granted here in the United States? Basically, the library existed as our goal because we wanted to give them an opportunity they had never had before, but we ran into tons of complications with that. Communication was the biggest issue by far. To get online, Govinda had to walk over an hour to an internet cafe where he could be online for two hours at a time. This was two hours a week of web access. And unfortunately, we frankly missed him on a few weeks. And this caused valuable time that we could have coordinated and find a solution and found a solution to our, some of our problems that we were having. And because of this, um, we also ran into more problems. We had 1,700 books donated to us to send physically to Nepal or to the SAP school. However, we quickly ran into problems when we found out that Nepal, the country, charged a 300% tariff on any product that was physically sent to that country. There was no way we were going to find a solution so that they could get the books to the country. Another issue, some of our contacts told us that they doubted because of the Nepal censorship laws that the books would even reach the country to begin with. Because of this, we knew we had to rethink our strategy. So now we're going to move to today's second question. We want to ask you, what do we do in this situation? And we want to ask ourselves the same thing because at that point in time, we had come across so many difficulties and recall that I'm still on the outside and these are visible even to us. We can see that there are going to be so many setbacks with this project and believe us, 16 weeks out from our school year being finished and having zero dollars to give to them, it seemed like we were doomed. So we had to ask ourselves, what can we do to solve this problem? What can we do to use this information effectively and start something that could be an absolute revolution for a school that could have never anticipated that it would exist for them. What we did is we rethought our strategy. 
In one conversation with Govinda, two conversations with Govinda, he found out that it would cost $2,000 to get internet and two laptops to the SAF school. If with constant internet and, constant co and a constant connection with Govinda, we knew that we could rethink a strategy and find a way to get them a library and also enhance their educational opportunities with the, with the internet, the World Wide Web, in their classrooms. And so we want to show you kind of a golden moment for the project. We want to show you sort of that time in which we were just getting things started, and that's the first thing we had to do, which was find a name. Opening, we wanted something that like opening the world. I know, like these, but like these like work as slogans though. Like, like it, it's okay, fine, guys. but. Also, Jake does have a point. Right. What I'm thinking, what Ginger talked about today is that we don't want to end it after. Okay, stop the video. I want you to watch my dad when he gives a suggestion. This is probably the slickest move I've ever seen in my life. As an watch his body language here. We've gotten a laptop, so we want something that's kind of like broader like uh, that. Yeah. We continue to the open world project. <laughs> The open world project. Right Needless there. to say, we were a little impressed. <laughs> so, again, this goofy guy, it once again shows how integral of a role he's played throughout this entire process. Even the name comes back to this goofy guy, Kevin Honeycutt. So we had found a name. And there were some technical aspects early on that we knew we had to establish to even begin to think about getting the ball rolling. There were so many things to do. We didn't even know where to begin, but Ben has a great explanation of how they got started. Well, uh, I began this project initially with a student named Jake Waters. Jake Waters is currently a film student at the University of Kansas, and he had a high dollar camera that he could have used. But we filmed our first video, and let me tell you, it didn't feel right to have Spielberg quality production for a high school project. Something was <laughs> off about that. So after a wide variety of conversations with Jake, we did the unthinkable. We decided that we were going to film every video with my cell phone camera. And this wasn't an iPhone here. I like to call this phone the brick because about everything about it, its weight and the quality of the videos and pictures it produced were about like a brick, I would say. I would say over the course of time that he owned that phone, it continually looked more and more like a brick as time went on. Scratches, and it just looked like it was held together by mortar, to be honest. So we begin to sort of see that this 1.3 megapixel camera that we're using to capture video isn't necessarily Spielberg quality like he said. What we came to realize though, we filmed our first video. Let me tell you, it looked bad. To steal the slogan of Podstock, rock the 80s, it looks like we filmed this video in 1981, let me tell you. But that didn't matter. It didn't matter that the video quality was poor. What mattered is that anyone who watched this video is seeing that two high school students in central Kansas, in a town of 1,000 people, is trying, they are trying to change the lives of students halfway around the world. Everyone can identify with that. Everyone who could watch the video identified with what we were trying to do. Um, I would say the high school quality was also emulated in everything else we did. This website here, I don't know, it's not the pinnacle of organization, I would say. Um, as my dad would say, it's an ADHD nightmare as you look at it. But it was high school. It was us. Anything else wouldn't have felt real. It wouldn't have felt genuine. What we were doing was a high school pro a project that was attempting to make a difference. And it was at this time that I'm still an outsider, but I'm kind of hanging out with them. Like, I'm sort of in the background in some of the videos where they're doing things, you know, like finding a name. I'm over at the other table listening to music and just doing my own thing. So it was at this point that I started hanging out with these guys and I started sort of feeling like a part of the project. But again, remember that I'm not contributing really. I'm just kind of there. And what I did notice, however, was that this website looked like a high school project. This website, and reflected by the videos, also looked like a high school project, and it looked like something that was just thrown together in a couple of days' time. But again, it reflected exactly what we were trying to do. It reflected the exact mission and the exact approach that we were taking to it. 
And so, even though the website looked bad, even though our videos came out terrible, there was one video where I did a swivel effect because I was filming Ben and Jake, and we did 40 takes on that video because we broke down laughing every time we watched it. There was a point where Ben's voice squeaked, and it was so pixelated that you couldn't even see the drawing that we were trying to show on the video. So needless to say, all the disorganization was to some effect, but in re reality it was pretty hilarious as well. There are unexpected uh, benefits to this as well. We didn't get into this wanting to start a business. We got into this wanting to help students halfway around the world. But what we learned through Google Analytics and through Facebook Insights, we learned when to launch our statuses, when we would get the highest uh, response, highest feedback from our statuses, and we essentially learned how to run an effective business as two high school students. This was definitely an unexpected benefit which is still serving us to this day. And talking about the application of those things, we have to focus on the fact that we were required to learn those to make any progress whatsoever. Thankfully, even though everything was a disorganized mess, it seemed, <coughs> we were able to use them effectively enough to propel ourselves forward. And thus, we did reach some initial success. There was an incredible response to what we were doing. In the first two weeks, we had raised $375 and had over 100 likes on our Facebook page. But none of us could expect our English teacher to march into our classroom and say, hey, Cake News is coming in one hour. Cake News, a, a news station, a prominent news station in Wichita, Kansas. They're coming in one hour. Do you have anything we can show them? <laughs> Needless to say, it was a little nerve-wracking, but Here's another golden moment. A passion for reading and learning have inspired some high school students in the middle of America to help some students in the middle of Nepal. Our library is a perfect place to get kids exposed to what all is going on around the world and learn about everything that's happening. These high school seniors are using their tech-savvy skills to build a library in Nepal and also connect those students to the rest of the world. This could open up an entirely new world for these students. That's, I guess, what was so inspiring to me because this it allows an innumerable amount of possibilities for these students. What uh, we are trying to do is give that access to these kids in Nepal um, to bring this whole global experience to them, that um, uh, these experiences that they have never had before. Every year. After this, the day after this uh, Cape News broadcast launched, we went from having $375 on our little meter to our, on our website to $1,500 overnight. And believe us, $375 seemed like a big deal. <laughs> we thought that was cool. We thought that was the like pinnacle of the project at that point. We couldn't believe that someone would donate that amount. So when I was on the website the day before and the day after and noticed that it jumped to $1,500, we were all a little flabbergasted. Perhaps the biggest, at least at the time, what we thought was the biggest uh, 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 part of the Cape News broadcast was that a local business in Bueller, Kansas called us the next day and said they wanted to sponsor us and donate $2,000 at the end of the semester for our project. We thought at this point we had $3,500 for our project and that we were almost to the finish line. So consider where we're coming from. We went to Bueller High School, which is just a few miles outside of Hutchinson, where we've both been for most of our lives. And after Cake News came and talked to us, I mean, a prominent news station in Wichita, a city much larger than Hutchinson, came and talked to us, man. They came and talked to us and wanted to hear what we had to say. And then the Hutch News wanted to write a little article in the newspaper. We didn't think that was much of a big deal. We were just like, oh, okay, let's get this over with. And they brought up some good points. I mean. Uh, Kevin Hardy, the writer, really conveyed the message of what we were doing really well, but at the time we didn't really value that. And they obviously cared a lot about what we were trying to do and they got our message out to the public and we just didn't really appreciate it at the time. We didn't think, like, what audience is this going to reach that the Cake News broadcast didn't already reach? I mean, Cake News is shown in Hutchinson, Kansas, and we're like, it's cool, but really, whatever, at this and, point, you and know. Now we realize that was rather naive of us. But we'll get a little more into that later. Well, then the setbacks occurred. January, everything is rosy. We think we have $35 in our bank account. We think we're uh, ready for prime time. However, in February, um, things, started getting, things started getting bad. We went from having at least $20, uh, a $20 donation every single day in January to having no donations at all for three weeks. Uh, I actually got sick, more sick than I've ever been in my entire life. I missed he, two weeks of school. He was emaciated, to be completely yeah. honest. His face was sunken in, 
he got skinnier than I've ever seen him in my entire life during that time. It was something like 12 pounds, I don't know. But, <laughs> you see, uh, at this point though, the project started moving away. It started seeming like this wasn't, um, that this was actually going to be much harder than we thought, and graduation was around the corner. It became so hard, it began to be really hard to focus on this project, but then perhaps the worst news came in the beginning of March. Um, the local business that had called us had a contract with Bueller High School. We had the, got the information from our senior legacy leader that Bueller High School had informed them, a local, in a school board meeting the night before, that they had dropped the business, the, dropped the contract with that business that was going to donate to us. And because of that, the sponsor informed us that they were no longer donating to the project. At the time, to be honest, it looked like we were just as far away from achieving or to uh, finding success in this project as we were back in December. And this was a heartfelt blow. The entire school experienced the blow. Again, I'm on the outside. I'm watching Bueller News every morning and I get to see the progress videos that they're making, again with a cell phone camera, and we're all absorbed by this project. We're consumed. We can't believe what we're doing as a senior class, and then we get to hear that $2,000 is being removed. What we thought was a finish line for us, what we thought was going to complete our mission and give us the opportunity that we needed to give something to these students that they had never had in their entire lives. So you can imagine the emotion we all felt, not just Ben, not just Jake, and not just the senior officers, as an entire senior class when we were told that we were missing $2,000 that we thought was promised to us. So this is where I got involved. This is where I came into the project and said, I can't let this go any longer. I'm tired of being a background to this project. I'm tired of sitting in the back, listening to my favorite band while they're doing all this cool stuff, like trying to give laptops and a library to students in Nepal. I couldn't let the opportunity go. And at one point, Ben and I got in this huge fight because <laughs> We started going around to local businesses together because we realized we need a new sponsor, we need to generate some new donations, and we got in this terrible fight. It was like my first week of being involved in the project, and I wanted to wear the open world t-shirt because we were high school students and we wanted to appeal to the businesses in that way. Ben, darn it Ben, I wanted to, wanted to wear a suit. <laughs> so out of all the things to fight about, to get an argument about, first week Connor's involved this argument, it sounds minute, sounds like it's not a big deal. We didn't talk for two days. Mm -hmm. The suits versus t-shirt debate deserves to go in the halls of legend for how big of a fight that was. This argument started at noon in AP government, and we were in the debate room at 4 o'clock later that day, still yelling at each other, no, we should be high school students. No, we should wear suits, we're professionals. We were so against each other in this, and it was the stupidest thing to fight over. Our assistant principal came from the principal's office to see what was going on we and thought that this in the fight halls. was about to happen <laughs> when it was suits versus t-shirts. By the way, I was totally right on that. I don't know like, if you want, if you want my own opinion. Obviously, we still have a little bit differing opinions on that, but the moral of the story is that I came onto the project wanting to do something big, and the first thing we did was not talk for two days because of silly arguments. And there's actually a learning experience here. Um, I would say we're both strong-willed individuals. We both like to take the lead on something. And for us to work together, it's a challenge every day. Like, we get in little arguments all the time about the most minute of things. Like, even before we were setting up, it was which computer was on which side, you know? But being able to work through these problems, being able to work together, taught us vital lessons that are going to, I think, going to benefit us as we go through the future. We're all going to have to work with someone. Unless we go to a little remote island where we want to live by ourselves for the rest of our lives, we're going to have to work with other people. Yeah. You know? And I think that these lessons, I mean, I, I wouldn't trade them for the world. And definitely the fact that we got to work together in this kind of scenario. He and I have been friends for 15 years. This is a dream for us. We've known each other since kindergarten, and believe it or not, we hated each other then because we liked the same girl. So this is a reoccurring <laughs> theme. We would chase her around at recess, and it seems like our fight over t-shirts and suits is of, yeah. of about the same magnitude. Yeah. So I came onto the project because I couldn't bear standing in the back anymore, and this is in March, and really, things start getting going from this point on. So, okay, remember that Hutch News article that we didn't think mattered at all? Here's where we ate our words, happily. So, I get an email from, and this is early March, from a man named Nicholas Lau, who lives in Texas, telling me, hey, um, I'm traveling to Nepal, like, next week, and, like, I'm going to be, like, 30 minutes from your school. Do you want me to go and just take pictures and video of your school? 
And I was like, um, yeah, sure, that sounds great, yeah. Because at this time we had 13 pictures at the school. And Nick said, well, I found your, I set a Google Alerts to the word Nepal. Um, and I found your article in a Texas newspaper. So, how does this happen? How does Nicholas Lau find our newspaper article in a Texas newspaper using Google Alerts? Well, that Hutchinson News article we didn't really care about, that was picked up by AP, which was then syndicated in the newspapers throughout Oklahoma, Texas, Iowa, and Colorado. <laughs> this was a huge deal and perhaps was the turning point for the entire project. And I think the thing to stress here is to go away from the story for a little bit, Web 2.0. This is what that is. Google Alerts, using keywords to find things that matter to you or matter to other people is what got us so far with the project. It found us a person who was traveling there and ended up providing with us with over 200 pictures of the school and about 10 videos of classrooms, of the students, of interviews with Govinda. These were things that were priceless and he didn't he didn't want anything for it, he offered it. And I think this stresses the importance of using technology today in the classroom because what did it do for us? Of course we got the Hutch News article to go to AP that was syndicated and obviously it led to this big deal, but it wouldn't have even happened without Google Alerts and Web 2.0. And that stresses the importance of use in today's classrooms, I think. It, well, it shows the mixture in today's world. Like a newspaper article, a local newspaper article is published in Hutchinson, Kansas which ends up having such a ripple effect that it helps children all the way in Bagashwari, Nepal. It's amazing because any high school project nowadays, even if it's picked up by a local newspaper, can end up making ripples halfway around the world. It shows where we are in today's world, really, with, uh, with technology and with the Web 2.0 and how powerful Web 2.0 really can be. So, a week later, we get a phone call from the Powerful Learning Practice, a company based in Virginia, telling us that they're going to give us a $1,000 donation to the Open World Project. They had also heard about the project just from our Facebook page and our website, and said that they wanted to see us reach the finish line, get these laptops to the students. This gave us a total of $2,500 for the project, and in the next month, uh, after working through various struggles, uh, getting securing the wire transfer to Govinda's bank, we were able to wire $2,500, and in the next week, Govinda was able to purchase two laptops and the internet access for his students. Uh, uh, needless to say, this was monumental. I mean, this was one of the biggest things, to receive this picture and see students sur surrounding Govinda. They're all smiling. Seeing them being able to use something that they had never used in their lives was a magical time for us. And securing this was something that a month ago, we didn't believe that we could do. Four months ago, we didn't believe we could achieve this goal. So, I'd like to stop right here. This school right here, months ago, we thought the project was over. We thought that there was going to be no possible way we were going to be able to help a school, a school where students had to wash and rewash their paper. April 3rd, 2011, four months after we start the project, we have our first successful Skype call with the SAS school. Hey! Hey, can you, can you see us? Now, this is something that still makes me emotional to this day. Because this was the first big moment for me and the project. This was the first time I had actually been there. I mean, I'm in the last three or four seconds of this video when we finally connect uh, in Skype. We finally got our videos to sync up and go together. This was the first time I had actually been in contact with these students for real. And for Ben and Kevin as well, it was astonishing for us to even be able to do this. And look. This is a bad video. There are lapses in audio, the video freezes from time to time, and again, the last three to four seconds, we get to wave at them and hear, what's your best color? Out of all the questions we could have been asked, we've been working with the school for four months, we haven't met any of the students. Out of all the questions the students could have asked us, the first one was, what is your best color? And that, which was asked by a five-year-old student named Ashika from the SAV school. It was 
a moment I still struggle to describe to this very day. And while the video is choppy, we know that the video is very choppy. What it meant for the SAV school is something I, I, I can't describe. They have access now. This meant they had access. This meant we could now help the school get a library and really attain an edu a type of education they couldn't have had before this time. And what's more, again, this was the thing that we didn't think we could do. And it was the biggest moment for us. We were, I think we would both call this one of the happiest moments in our lives, to be able to connect with a school who we didn't even imagine would have those capabilities at any point. Since that time, the staff school now has implemented the laptops into their curriculum. Uh, they've connected, they've formed partnerships with schools in Pakistan and other schools in Nepal. They've Skype called schools in Mexico and schools all around the world. What they use the laptops for now is really an educational act. It's, uh, it's fully integral to where they are in their education. Govinda designs all of his lesson plans on the laptops. And then he uh, has groups. He breaks his children out in groups every day so that every student has a chance to be around the laptop or to use the laptop every single passing day. Uh, it's incredible. And the connections that they have made, every, every time they make a connection, they send us pictures of the Skype event. And just seeing the students, how it affects students, not only the students in the SAF school, but the students they connect with in the United States, in Pakistan, in Mexico. It's an educational experience that I can't, I really struggle to describe. And, and let's, you know, let's come back to the United States for a second. How many of you think that Microsoft Paint is a legitimate software to use in your classroom right now if you're in like higher education or anything like that? I mean, most of us think it's obsolete. Most of us think that it's mundane. And I mean, it has its functions, but this is the world to these students. For the first time ever, they get to draw a digital apple tree on Microsoft Paint using the computers that we sent to them, and they get to use Microsoft Word to craft their biographies that we get to feature on their websites. These computers have become such an integral part of their curriculum that we couldn't even imagine that they would have these capabilities, but what's more is that they are able to do all of their lessons, on, I mean, they're learning English, they're able to learn how to use this technology, and again, they've never had it before. Uh, the laptops, the first project they did, they did it with a school in, um, in Pakistan where they both made drawings on Microsoft Paint and compared them. All those pictures are on the Open World Facebook page, but just seeing the students craft all of their images on Microsoft Paint and create an art project, before they had, they had to use paper for writing, you know, they had to, you know, rewash paper to use it in the classroom. They can now create, recreate, redesign any image they want to on Microsoft Paint and continually do it each and every day without worrying about their lack of their resources or their lack of resources. It's an experience that I think maybe some of us take for granted, but it's also something that we can learn from because I certainly wouldn't have thought of Microsoft Paint in the same way until we learned what they were doing with it. And so then came the library. Then came one of the final goals that we had set for the project, and everything was full circle. Remember that this was our first goal. This was the thing that we wanted to do from the very beginning, but originally it was the thing we had the most complications with. Um, so uh, we had $2,500. We sent the school laptops and internet access. We thought it was mission accomplished. We thought we had crossed the finish line. We were doing a little dance, you know, well, I'll, I'll admit. But in the next week, we had over $2,000 in donations back to our project. We didn't know what we were going to use the donations for at first, but after talking with Govinda, uh, we decided that we were going to use that money to bring them the library. The initial thought that we wanted, the initial goal of the project was to bring them the library. After, after, months of, after months and months of work, we were able to achieve that goal. So we want to talk a little bit about what worked for us, because we think it's a good point to bring up and analyze, especially for ourselves at this point, what we did that even made us successful. Because let's look back at the library. They named it Ben's Den. They're clearly connected with us in a way that we couldn't have imagined. And so how did we achieve that? And it, it paid to analyze these things because now we can move forward and use these tools in the same way. So if we look at some of this, we know that we've stressed social media and our information outlets, like our website. The things that we crafted online to help reach our audiences and to help do things that we wouldn't have believed that was possible before helped us immensely. And that led to learning how to promote what we wanted to do. It led to how we should make our videos, what pictures we should put out there. We learned how to make our message viral. 
And we learned how to index all of our ideas. If Google hadn't picked up some of the links or crawled on the websites that we were using, none of this would have been possible because if you search for the SAP school now, open world comes up eventually, but at the time, it didn't. We gave an outlet to the school and to ourselves to help ourselves achieve exactly what we needed to achieve. And finally, communication. Remember that Govinda was traveling once a week to an internet cafe to use it for maybe an hour. This was the time we were limited to to contact him and discuss things with him and to hopefully bring in the library that ended up allowing the project to absolutely fulfill its mission. So communication through web conferencing, Skype, and email allowed us to use things and create a business that we didn't even know we were doing. We didn't even know that we were becoming entrepreneurs because we were doing this in school and we thought it was the best thing in the world. It wasn't a class, it was something we wanted to do. When examining, we have talked to a couple of classrooms about collaborating with the SAP school. And right, and right here, when looking at what worked for us, there's not a for dummies book about this in Hastings. You're not going to walk in Hastings and find an outline or a step by step, uh, a step a step by step guide for how to make something like this work, how to communicate to a school with the resources such as the SAV school. But what we want to do is we want to do say the best we can, give the best possible outline we can for any schools or classrooms who's interested in making these types of connections, because we definitely know what works and what's amazing. We can't put a price tag on the value that this, this lesson had for us as students. We didn't go into this, as Connor said, we didn't go into this wanting to be business, uh, wanting to run a business. But now we use the skills that we learn on a daily basis. We both have websites now where we use all of the skills we acquired from, from the SAV school, from working with the SAV school on a daily basis. The value of this, I, I, can't, you know, I can't even describe. And in reflection, we had to analyze this, like I said, but it also made us ask new questions. It also made us say, you know, what more can we do? We crossed the finish line. We got them two internet or two laptops and internet access, and we got them the library. It seemed like things were done, and we had accomplished our goal. So at that point, it was like, you know, what more can we do after analyzing the fact that some of this stuff worked? I mean, can you believe that? Almost, it, it seems surreal to us. And then we began asking ourselves more questions: What else can we do for the school? And when this happened, we started looking at how or what they were surrounded with and asking ourselves, does it matter if we gave them laptops and internet access in a library if the walls fall down in their schools because of monsoon season? Govinda is pictured here rebuilding the walls himself. The children couldn't go to school for a week because of this. And furthermore, they have property issues. They have a landowner who has taken away their lease and started using one of their school buildings for something else. So say goodbye to 25 of, those, of their students. Say goodbye to some of the kids who have one opportunity to go to school, and that's at the SAV school. And what's more is the fact that they could have this land taken away from them at any point in time. At this juncture, we had to question whether we continue the project. Uh, we had just graduated. We were kind of on that graduation high. It's a weird time being done with high school and being ready for college. That time, it was the weirdest time of my life because it didn't feel like I was really anywhere. And one day to receive a message from Govinda that we just lost three of our classrooms and 25 of our students. At that point, I didn't know what to, we didn't know how to respond. You know, we thought we were done. We got the laptops, we got the library, we thought we were across the finish line. But after asking our, after many conversations between Connor and I, we realized that if we let this go, if we drop this project, we would be wasting an incredible opportunity or something that was probably the most important. This is the most one of the this is the most important project I'm involved with in my life right now. To let that go would be a huge waste, and also I I would say be letting the students at the staff school down. And what's more is that we realized the potential of what we could do. We want to do so much more, and we want to make so many more connections, and so. We started asking ourselves, how can we do these things? How can we approach the solutions that we want to achieve? And we thought about moving forward. We thought about what we could actually do to make education a real possibility, even a permanent future for the students at the SAV school. So what we came, our, well, the solution we came to is that now we're opening phase two of the open world project. We're now open world. We're wanting to move from a high school project to a fully fledged organization. And what we hope to do um, is that we're hoping to bring a new school um, that has uh, a new school that has running water and electricity to the SAV students, but more importantly, on land that they can call their own. What you know, I want to point out here, just real quick, is that this is 
a picture that Govinda sent us a month ago of builders using the land that was already or supposedly promised to the staff school. Obviously, that's not the case anymore. But they're building on this land, and they've taken away the children's playground. They just, he decided he wanted to build a new building for himself there, so that's what it gets used for now, instead of students. And so I think what we want to stress here is resiliency. We want to stress yeah. the fact that we realize that we could power through something that would be way more meaningful than even a library. Step, stepping outside for a moment, seeing how if a project like this was implemented in a classroom, what lessons can be learned? I think the most valuable lesson we had here was that failure was okay. We could fail here, if and we could fail and keep going. Like if we had been graded individually on every individual we ha idea we had for open world, we would have failed over and over again until we flunked out of the class. What this taught us was that failure was an option and that we could power through failure. It now, now whenever we're hit with a setback, it's not well, that's it then, it's over. It's what do we do to fix this problem? What do we do to move on? What do we do to power through this? This a lesson of resiliency is one um, that you know I couldn't put a price tag on, and I think it's still reflected in the way in everything about phase two of the project. Now that we're on phase two though, I have, I have to reach out. We need help. What we're doing now is we're trying to reach out to schools, um, to schools in the United States. In fact, uh, Kim Heron, a teacher in Inman, just actually, uh, after a conversation yesterday, uh, we are now working on a partnership in that classroom. A partnership to help try to make a difference for phase two of the project. What we hope to do is to reach out to schools all around the United States to partner with the SAV school. Just a conversation about like what food they, what food is, do we have in the United States compared to what food do we have in Nepal teaches valuable lessons and, and is an incredible opportunity for the students in these classrooms and the students of the SAV school. And so to be more specific, we begin approaching these solutions by hypothesizing what we can do to make these things possible. First of all, we have to discuss a land to build on. We have to discuss the fact that none of this matters if the land isn't theirs, if they can't do with that land what they want. And so Govinda actually provided a few pictures for us of plots of land in the area that would be suitable for the school. The one on the right there is exactly one of those pictures. And what we're experiencing now is we're sort of at this crest where we're seeing all the opportunities we're seeing everything that we can do, and we definitely want to exercise and complete those goals. We want the school to have functioning utilities. We want them to have electricity, running water, internet, a room where volunteers can come and stay. Can you imagine a classroom for these students where all of these availabilities are here? I mean, everyone will be going to that school to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it's a serious situation in Nepal, and to provide them with something like this is it just seems like an opportunity that we can't pass up. Moving away from phase two, beyond phase two, our dream is to start a fully fledged organization where we partner classrooms in the United States with classrooms all around the world. What we want to do is we want to be able to provide the experiences that we had with this project, but also provide opportunities for students all around the world to learn as we did and learn as the SAV, as the SAV students have. We want to be able to share this mission. That is our dream, that is our dream to be a fully fledged organization and that's how we want to help the world. What I would say is that right now we have the opportunity to change the world from our keyboard. What's stopping us? And furthermore, sharing our message, even if you tell someone else about open world, you're a part of the cause. You're a part of what we're trying to do and that correspondence, the partnerships that we want to make with educators like you, the people who you know made our high school education valuable to us, the people who made us feel like our lives were changed, we want to reach out to all of you. Yesterday we got to talk again with Kim Heron and we got to talk with Diane Smoke. She's, these people are going to create opportunities and partnerships during this next school year that we believe will change the way the SAV school looks at education and simply becoming a part of this we believe we can change the world. We truly do. Through these partnerships, if, we, if we're able to spread the word of this cause and other causes around the, around the United States or around the world, we think we can change the world for students all around the world. You know, uh, we just have to get started, I guess. And the one thing we ask you to do is check us out. Go to our website. Look at where we are in social networking. Follow Ben and I, talk to us. We love talking with people. We love making connections. And again, we're trying to make these partnerships that we believe will change the future for these students, not only in Nepal, but if we become the fully fledged organization that we want to be, we will become something that can change the world 
not just for two schools, one in the United States and one in Nepal, but for tons of schools in the United States and other schools all throughout the world. Follow us on Twitter, get in contact with us, send us an email and say, hey, we love talking to people and we love reaching out. Thank you guys so much for coming and listening to us today. We cannot stress it out enough. we want to remind everyone is that uh, if you have an account on Prezi.com, you can look at this presentation as many times as you want to. You can go in there and look at this presentation, see all the contact information. If you missed anything today, if you want to watch one of our videos again, feel free. We want this to be as publicly available as we can. Another thing, we have a little time left for questions. Does anyone have any questions about anything, absolutely anything? It can go, we can go back to Connor and I's fight if you, you want to. You can even ask us, you know, what, what stories do we have from dorming together at KU? Or, or what is our best good. color? You know, what are those? Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys plan to actually go over there and see the signs? Mm -hmm. that, that's, um, that's, I would say after phase two, that's our first plan. Uh, we, were, we were incredibly fortunate. KU has one of the best travel abroad programs in the country, and they after we had a few conversations last year, we can start a student initiated travel abroad program. They don't actually have a program that goes to Nepal, right. but they said, hey, create one. If you create an effective program, this pro you can actually start a program that is in our university forever that can, you know, right. for the last year. And the first thing we're doing when once we get back to KU, uh, Ben had an anthropology professor uh, just last semester. Awesome guy. He's so fun to listen to. And he let us uh, present at one of his speak out. Uh, deals at his lectures. He has like times where people come in and students can share something for a minute. But Ben says, you know, usually it's students who get up at the podium and say, hey, if you go like my Facebook page, uh, I can get a free pizza tonight at the restaurant. <laughs> and he let us speak for two to three minutes on what we were doing here. And we actually, you know, connected with some people. And so we talked to this professor and he's going to help us create a student organization at KU. He's going to help us reach out to other students and do the things that Ben and I can't do alone. In an email, he travels to Peru every summer. I emailed him this summer to make sure it was, you know, it, that this was still going to happen, that our mm -hmm. agreement was still in place. He said, first part of the semester, let's have a conversation and let's roll. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're incredibly excited. Our, what we've been talking about, it would be really cool after we raise the money for phase two to travel there and help, help the students build the school. You know, that's what right. we would love to do. And we, obviously want to meet Govindo. We want to meet all these students. The video connections are awesome, but to meet them would be phenomenal. Uh, Sorry, so, so uh, we can help you out, but how much are you looking for phase two? So we can start. Uh, phase phase two, uh, the outline right now, $125,000 is what we're looking for. Uh, it's a lot. Um, what we're looking for now, um, individual donations are incredible, um, but um, I guess the main difference from phase one is now we're looking, uh, corporate sponsors might be necessary here, just because of the amount of money. And I would say uh, there might be some adjustments. We have to be very quick about buying land. Right, we need to buy the, the, land the economy right the now. The downturn in the world economy actually caused the land price, the price of their land to drop incredibly. But if there's an upturn in the world economy, Govinda told us the land could go up two to three, two to three times where it is now, just because of uh, you know, just because of the world economy and how that affects. And donation wrestling. information is on your website. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, everything is world on our website. It's, yeah. Right, it's openworldcause.com. Everything is there. Govinda's even written a complete write-up of the school. We didn't edit it at all. It's all his own words explaining everything about it. Another thing about the website, there's a Meet the Students page. That's definitely our most popular page out of anything. Uh, we have students write their own biographies, and uh, we haven't edited any of the biographies. By far our most hit page on our website. Right. I would definitely, if you want to get to know the students. If you want to make a personal connection with some of them, uh, some of them are, are just, uh, they're farm kids. They work on a farm with their parents. Remember, this is a rural area. And it's very relatable, relatable to you know some of the areas here in Kansas. Even we have tons of farm kids who come to school, and it's a little bit of a different situation. But again, it's completely relatable, and we yeah. think that's phenomenal. Were there any other questions? How much is the 
much for the land? Um, the land itself is 50000 right now. And we have a complete write-up. We constructed it with yeah. Govinda. We met with contractors. And uh, we have a complete list, a layout of at what everything is going to cost. We learned from phase one after working with businesses that we need to be thorough about, as two 19-year-olds, we have to be thorough about where the money is going. Uh, Govinda, uh, we have a, like, uh, Govinda has been so great about this. Every time he buys something new for the classroom, he takes pictures of it and we upload it to our Facebook page immediately. This, uh, and that accountability is important. I mean, I, we can't exactly hide the money under our beds anymore. You know, like this is, <laughs> we have this, uh, and because of that, we always try to complete lists or an right. outline so that everyone knows where exactly the money is And going. he went to multiple contractors. These are average numbers of him talking to about, excuse me, got the burps right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Talk to about five different contractors about, uh, you know, what that might cost. So these costs are, are fairly varied and all put together to sort of adjust for differences in opinion and things like that. So we're trying to, again, be as thorough as we possibly can. More questions? Mom. As, yeah. a, as a teacher, can you tell us what kinds of things, if we wanted to encourage students to have a project and be successful, what kinds of things worked? And if you want to say, you know, what kinds of things weren't really helpful, mm -hmm. that's up to you. Like a, a project that would work with the school? Like well, in, as, as, you know, I think she means like a... Like if we wanted to inspire our kids to do something life changing like this in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kinds of things do teachers do that helped your project, or what kinds of things really got in the way and well, the um, I would say having a direct connection to the school was important. Like that's mm -hmm. incredibly inspiring to see students around the world. It makes you want to get involved. Pictures are, have been incredible, um, just because you see that there is an incredible need for these schools. I think the most important tool that we can identify is web conferencing. Yeah. If you're trying to connect with a school across the world, you're going to have to connect with them somehow. Email isn't enough sometimes, and even if it's if it's through Skype, obviously there are chat options as well. It doesn't have to be a video each time, but communication cannot be stressed enough. But something else that I want to say is, um, you know, you have to look for the right sort of motivation in people to have an involvement like this. We encountered so many setbacks from people who thought they wanted to be involved and made promises to us that weren't fulfilled, and that's something that you're going to deal with, but we think that it's important to find people with a similar dream, and if you can unite those people, you know, Kim and I talked yesterday about after school projects or after school initiatives. Ben and I would stay till 9 p.m. on debate nights because that was what we loved about school. It goes so, back to the idea of resiliency. Mm -hmm. You know, like being able, like if we have a sponsor drop, if we have someone who doesn't fulfill on their promise, we're going to keep going. You know, and another thing I would, going back, you know, going back to Michelle Honeycutt's question, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing I would say, uh, if I could change one thing about phase one, um, with teachers, from a teacher standpoint, Organization matters. Um, there was absolutely no organization from any of the senior officers, and having, and the reason, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not indicting anyone here. This is not on the books. This is not, you know, this, you're not going to find this anywhere. Uh, having an organization to give people tasks. I, to be honest, I like, I think I took on way too much. Um, like, uh, I was staying staying up every night, and then I took the most unfortunate part of phase one was that uh, we launched T-shirts. At first, and like I and I'm terrible with the details. I think that might be hereditary. I don't know, but um, <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I'm so, sorry, Dad. You know. But um, well, you, it's not like you don't tell stories of me in the treehouse or anything in your presentation. But, well, and it's a really funny story. I, I remember Ben came into school one day. I lost the sheet. I don't have the sheet. What the people? With, their names, who got shirts, I don't know. I mean, it was crazy. We and didn't I, even know who got or bought these t-shirts. We were able to figure it out, thankfully, but having organization at the very top, having assigning jobs to people saying, okay, you're going to be in charge of pub publicity, something like that, that's, I would say having more organization was how I would change phase one, if I could. Ben, uh, kind of along the lines of Michelle's question, you know, I, I'm thinking of this because I'm a teacher, and if I was working with you guys at the time and this was going on, what did the teacher say to you that made you want to keep doing this? And what did they say wrong to you? Um, okay, um, there was terminology is important. Um, we had, there were a couple of teachers who were very dead-ended about this, who came up to us while we were trying to make this, we were trying to do something, I think, that was pretty substantial here. And we had teachers who would say, if 
this isn't going to work out. You know, we have, you know, there was another idea to like restore a park bench in the hometown. Uh, there, were, there were naysayers. <laughs> I mean, and, and even the teacher who had said, you know, this guy might be a scam artist, the negative terminology that he used with us when he was talking about that uh, kind of discouraged it, us. I it, mean, it made us feel bad about what we were doing. It wasn't, let's figure this out. It's, it, we could end the project. We might have to stop the project. And that made things really difficult. In the light of everything we were struggling with, uh, I would say uh, being positive, being like, hey, let's figure this out. You know, like, so it, a business dropped. It's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Like, once the business dropped, it legitimately for a week, it looked like we were done. It looked like the money, for a while, the money was going to be either given back or reused for the park bench project or something like that, you know. And so I would say, as a teacher, if I were in that position, um, you obviously want students to, to be proactive about it. You want students to take the ball and run with it. And I would say with these projects, they t that tends to happen. It's just that when there's going to be setbacks, in, um, I would say just be positive. You know, be, be like, okay. You know, I, I think for as many teachers that we had or people around us who were kind of dead-ended, and dead ended, like Ben said, or said, you know, this probably isn't going to work out, there were two times the amount of teachers or people around us who said, you guys can do this. This, yeah. this is going to work. And the positive enforcement that we have was absolutely the thing that changed our mindsets so, about what we were doing. We had a couple of amazing teachers who every time they saw us, how can I help? What can yeah. I do? Um, who volunteered at sporting events at Bueller who, uh, without even asking really, they just uh, they just went off and did it. Like we didn't have to ask them, you know. And uh, those were all. That was always incredible. That support we had. You know, we had a soup. We had a, we had a supper at Bueller High School that was done completely by teachers who wanted to make a difference. They, uh, at a local level, it was incredibly important to. Um, once the Cake News article, Hutch News, came, we had support on a local level, unlike anything I've ever seen before. The community came out and wanted this to happen, and I. It was yeah. overall. You know, again, and this is part where I was on the outside. You could see the influence and the power of what those who were encouraging us did, and and it became apparent very quickly. Um, it, we should probably get to the raffle. Uh, what, <laughs> one more, one more question. You said what I think is so important is that you took this high school project and you said that you learned like life lessons, be more organized, have things in the you know mm -hmm. lined out first. You said you learned a lot about when to launch things and who yeah. were the best times. And can you share something? Um, what we did is we looked at Google Analytics and Facebook Insights very, mm -hmm. very specifically. Um, if you're a page manager and if you've managed a page on Facebook before, the way they have it now is that the insights are just right there. So you can sort of see peaks and influence and what that allowed us to do was identify which messages were getting across to people. It allowed us to figure out, you know, which time is best to send a message out to our audience. Insights will tell you the every single person who laid their eyes upon our updates at mm -hmm. one time. Uh, we found out uh, Friday nights are a bad idea to post yeah. major <laughs> updates. Uh, we also found out uh, ten, really our highest our highest uh, traffic we have on our page comes Monday after school, Monday at five o'clock, and we have a large percentage percentage of educators, which yeah. would explain that. Um, and uh, it also tells you uh, uh, demographics too, like yeah, who's like age. Uh, uh, most it's mostly middle-aged people who come to our Facebook page. It's it's not high school students. It's not college students. I mean, the ratio is dramatically different. So yeah. it, I would say it's two thirds of the people who visit our page are educators or, or people who are older than us and want to be involved. Random facts: seventy-one percent of our followers on all networks are women. So I mean, just because um, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so cute. <laughs> Connor has that smile, you know. <laughs> We would love to answer any other questions outside of this. Uh, um, yeah. uh, we'll talk to any of you and we'll talk your ears off. Really, yeah. we will. Yeah. So seen, yeah. come up to us, but we really want to give this shirt away. And I'm sure this is sort of, we're getting towards the end of Podstock here. So we want to get you guys moving again. So uh, drum roll, please. All right, the moment of truth. Kathy Hines. Thank you all again so much for coming today. It, it means the world to us.
at the very end of the Q&A, so um, I'm going to take it back and charge it. Are you going to go So if I can leave that, maybe charge it up or drop it on your lap. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be here for the So, uh, I mean, you're just getting into this too, yeah. so I think you have something and, to relate uh, to. There's one more and, uh, so, but, so I decided everybody can vote, oh, well, so let's see You know, so if I can get them like a Facebook page and I can say, hey, look at this new app, or have you 
you thought about this, or, you know, so that's why I decided to pull that route. But I, but for that to be effective, you wanted to see it. Yeah. You have, yeah. To, you have to make sure that, so, you, have, you have to make sure you're reaching the right amount of people. Um, that's what Kevin does. I mean, uh, he makes his personal, but he also sends out stuff like, you know, check out this new, and that's what I do on his page. Um, so, you know, if we change the exchange emails, I can help you uh, establish that. And part of it's about getting that first, like, 100 followers. See, that, that's a good start. Once you get to 100, you can kind of reach people uh, vicariously. I mean, if someone sees and likes a status that you post, it's going to show well, up in their feed. And I've learned I very quickly what like it works like. Right. You know, so like, you know, I mean, I like, like, I'd already liked your page. But like, you know, like I, as the professional, went and liked, liked Andrea's. Uh-huh. You know, and I went as the professional and liked yours. That helps a lot. You know, and I was like, you know, you got two likes out of it. Well, I, I, the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the biggest thing that you can do with something like that is you can, um, when you like as a professional page, you can tag other pages and you know say, hey, I work with this person. Hey, did you at least clap while I was over there? No. I mean, yes. Okay. Of course. We knew exactly. Like if you're in a room where there's stairs and you go up, it tilts automatically for you. So they're pretty nice. Oh. Yeah, well, they, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's see what's happening. 